turn to the book of Genesis chapter 18 this morning. Genesis chapter number 18 and verse number 19. Genesis 18, 19. Here's what the Lord said about Abraham. For I know him. That he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Father, bless this book. Give me unction to preach it this morning. Give me some wisdom, Lord, to know how to reach people. Say what needs to be said. Minister to people that need to be ministered to, Lord. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I don't suppose there's anybody in the Bible, a human being, that is mentioned more as father than Abraham. All through the scriptures, he's called the father. Genesis 12, the Bible said, The Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, to a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Have you been blessed through Abraham? You better believe you have. You've been blessed through him. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Galatians 3, the apostle Paul takes it and puts it in a doctrinal connotation. He said, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. Preach before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. Memorize that, folks. Let that make a deep impression in your soul. And when somebody comes smiling to you today with a Bible, calling themselves a Christian that wants to drag you under the law, remember they're dragging you under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Ask you a simple question. Has anyone walked the face of this earth that kept every part of the law? And that's it. That's it. That's it. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. So Abraham is contrasted with the law. He is a blessing. And then in Hebrews eleven seventeen, by faith Abraham, or Abra- Abraham when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. This is part of the Christian life. You're going to be tried. It's part of living. You're going to be tried. It's part of growing. You're going to be tried. It's going to be part of understanding God because there's things about God you'll never know till you're tried. There's things about yourself you'll never know. Until you're tried. Don't ever fall into the trap of thinking you know everything that's going on in your heart. Don't ever think that you can walk in fellowship with the Lord by being able to judge your own heart. You can't do it. So I invite you this coming Wednesday night. This coming Wednesday night. Come and study with me. There's some things that God's taught me that I think will be a great help to you. And it'll open up some victory for you to begin to understand what's going on. Especially as it relates to sin. There's a big deal, folks. Big deal. So the Bible says in the book of uh, Genesis that Abraham was the friend of God. No other man was called the friend of God, but this man, Abraham. December the 18th, 1969, I became a father. I became a father. December the 18th, 1969. There she sits. That's my flesh and blood right there. 1969, Baptist Hospital. My wife came out after delivering her and said, don't you ever cause me to go back in here again. No epidurals in those. I don't know if they had, did they have epidurals in 1969? I don't know, whatever whatever it was, buddy. That was, that was, she made two trips in one, first and last. I carried my little girl in my hands. I lifted her up, looked at her, changed her diaper. This was my flesh and blood. I love my little girl. This is my daughter. And my friend, I love her to this day, and my love continues to grow for her to every day of my life. She's precious to me indeed. Oh, you must have a perfect daughter. Oh, no, 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 no. 
No. If you think you live in a perfect world, you're ready for the funny farm. If you think you're perfect, you're ready for the funny farm. You don't live in a real world. You don't understand the things that I'm talking about. I've heard an awful lot of preaching from an awful lot of preachers that make you think that they're the fourth person of the Trinity, the high sheriff of heaven. If they say it's wrong, it's wrong, so forth and so on. No, my friend, it doesn't work that way. She's my little girl. The thought never crossed my mind to walk off and abandon her. Never crossed my mind. She was mine, and I was going to be there with her. Never crossed my mind that I'd walk off. The thought, what then? Let's say you have walked off and left your children. Let's say you're out here somewhere and you're living it up. You're not living, you're dying. Your soul's dying, your spirit's dying, your life's dying, everything's dying around you. And once people get to know you and know how that you're full of yourself and you love yourself and that's all you live for is yourself, they'll die with you if they want to run with you. Oh, no, 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 no. I've lived long enough to understand that it takes more than that to make life, life. There's something for you in this life. There's a gift in this life. There's something precious in this life. There's a light higher than the light that you can produce. But you've got to find that light. Some things began to grow inside me. My wife was now a mother, and I was a father, and we had a daughter. We had a family. We had a home. How many of you have a family? Have you got children? Raise your hand. Are your children precious to you? Which is more important, your child or that car parked out there in the parking lot? What about the house you live in? What about your boat? What about your time, your time? Heard a man say the other day, he said, I had a good father, but he spent all of his time fishing and hunting and this and that and this and that. I know you didn't have a good father. I'm sure you love your father. But I'll tell you right now, that father, it's all right to fish and hunt. There's nothing wrong with that. But you also have a family to be around to take care of. Your kids need you. So what happened? Well, I understood I was the protector. I'm a protector. Still am, by the way. Protector of my family. There are things worth dying for. There's a hill that you die on. Have you found that hill yet? Have you found something in this life that you're willing to die for? Because if you haven't found something in this life that you're willing to die for, you don't really believe in anything. It's all, right. it's just all just a bunch of mumbo jumbo, relative morality, relative life. And I, this is my truth. That's garbage. That's right. That's right. Truth is either absolute or it's not truth at all. Amen. You've been listening to a crowd that's been brainwashed. They're trying to brainwash you. It's such a shame. Let me warn you. I want to warn you. Please listen to me. You live in an insane asylum. You would not go to an insane asylum, walk in and sit down and try to carry on a lucid conversation with someone insane. That's right. You wouldn't do that. That's right. You wouldn't do that. And this is not to make fun of these people. Anything we can do to help them, we would. Go out of our way. Now, I've seen enough suffering to do me 10 lifetimes. I don't add to anybody's problems and suffering and sorrow. But you cannot reason with an insane person. You can't reach their heart. You can't, there's no, there's no dialogue that can happen. So what are you saying, preacher? I am saying that much of the leadership and the elite in this country is insane or they're at least going along for the ride. Now let's go a step further. They're changing the identity and the essence of a human being. How many following that? How many understand how important that is? To change the essence of a human being, well, then that means that they have to remake it. That's it. That's the key. They have to remake it. Watch the remaking and watch for artificial intelligence to be on the forefront in doing it. Watch it. It's an amazing thing how 2023 it shows up. And here in, the, in this part of the year that it's really coming on strong, artificial intelligence. I've always had a desire to work. Always, always. Never, I, never, I never got up grumbling and complaining about going to work. I looked forward to it. The kind of work I did, too, was interesting because I, I was a line mechanic. And one day I might install an air conditioner. The next day I might do a valve job and so forth and so on. So it kept me busy. I might get an electrical problem short, have to find the circuit and the course and all that. Sure, all these things. But let me tell you what happened. I went to work every day. Why did I go? Because I wanted to go to work. Not only that, I was providing food for my family. I was making a paycheck. I was there. I was there to do what I needed to be doing. What do you, what? That's what men do. Amen. Well, you say, my, 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 my wife does. No, no, you do. 
unless there's a reason you cannot work, you do. And then your wife, if she wants to work, that's some, that has to do with each family, each individual case. I'm not against women working. But the problem is, the point is that the man accepts the primary responsibility for paying the bills, for feeding his family, for taking care of his home. He's the provider. Now we've got a situation where people have been working from home and they have the gall. I can't, they have the gall to ask you to leave your home and your computer and come in and go to work. What gall to expect you to come in and earn a paycheck. Isn't that horrible? That's terrible. How many of you know, understand that? Facetious, just a little bit of sarcasm in that. I've had people say, yeah, Lawson said this. Yeah, but you need to understand where Lawson said it and when Lawson said it and what's around what Lawson said. You have to understand what I'm talking about here this morning. I had my own business. I had a shop on Broadway. I had, uh, had a good business. 1973, God saved me. When he saved me, changed me. Something profound happened to me that had never happened to me before. Something began to move inside my soul. God came in. My life was completely changed. Whether another person on the face of this earth, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but I'm trying to say something. I do not depend on anybody's testimony to witness to what I had happen to me. Whether another person on this earth ever had anything happen to me, I know what happened to me. And I know where it brought me from. I know what it did for me. I know what he did for me. And I want to tell you something. There's none of you too far gone that he can't do it for you. It doesn't make any difference who you are. No, I don't care. You might, you might have staggered in here today full of crack cocaine. You might, have, you might have crawled out of a bordello this morning. It doesn't make any difference where you came. I don't care anything about that because Christ is able to save to the uttermost all that come to God by him. We well, say, I'm going to find me a church where they're clean and, they're, and, they're, and, and, the, and they look good and smell good. Go find you one. And you'll look just like them in about six months. And your head will be so far up in the clouds and you'll be so stuck up with self-love and your holier-than-thou attitude and looking down your nose at everybody, you won't be worth a dime to anybody. So have you ever had anybody like that help you? Have you ever had a real religious person who, I mean, they're, they're steeped in it, boy. Dare not do anything. You ever had one of them reach out and love for you? No, you haven't and you won't. No, no, no. The Bible said, to whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. Yeah, yeah. You want to know why I look at these kids the way they come up? You know why I love kids? You know why it brings a smile on my face? Because they're innocent and they're young. They're impressionable. We're either going to teach them right or we're just going to, you know, brush them aside. They're not important. Oh, they're important, all right. They're very important. But I know it's hard to preach to kids if you don't live what you preach. I understand that. That'd be a problem for me, too. That's a problem for anybody. Amen. 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 Then God called me to preach. My wife said he did what? She said, I married a Marine. I didn't marry a preacher. <laughs> We went to Camp Lejeune. First place we had to live in was a silver trailer made like this. 500 of them looked alike. Yeah, they did. You come staggering in drunk one night, you'd never find your home. <laughs> That's right. I mean, they all, they called it Silver City. Every one of them looked alike. You better, you better, you better remember which one was yours. I'm not kidding. <laughs> He put me here at Temple in August, 1976. They wanted a full-time pastor, but they couldn't support a full-time pastor. So what'd you do? You go crying about it? No, I didn't cry. I kept my tools. I still got them. A lady came through here, one of these highbrow, looked down their nose at you, you know, super, super spiritual, full of super faith, and said to my wife, I've got, these toolboxes I've got are, are, are uh, uh, 
of the high, the expensive. Snap on. And I've had them for over 50 years. They're worth a pile of money right now. I mean, they're antiques, if nothing else. She said to my wife, she said, if your husband wanted to live by faith, he'd sell those toolboxes and get rid of them and live by faith. I thought to myself, well, what happens if my car breaks down? <laughs> what if I got a flat? What if I want to tune it up, jerk plugs out of it? You know, back then they had plugs and points and condensers, and a lot of you folks don't know what that is today. They don't have that stuff. Back when I worked on them, that's what they had. Timing lights, dwell meters, you know. You, had to, you, you, you could see the advance and watch the timing lights, see how, see how far that, that, that thing was advancing before it fired. Had all that. And I'm supposed to get rid of that? No, sir, buddy. You'd hold those tools up next to you. And I love this ratchet right here, buddy. I've had this thing. This is my tool. This is my tool. How many of you mechanics feel the same way about your tools? How many of you mechanics don't like loaning your tools to somebody else? See how those hands flying up? You guys know what I'm talking about. You take care of your tools. I got tools over 50 years old. They look practically brand new. You take care of them. I was a professional mechanic. That's my livelihood. So what happens? They can't pay me enough, but they want a full-time pastor. So what do you do? In 20 degree weather, I lay out in the driveway and do valve jobs, do brake jobs. I make money, I make money I need to make, pay my bills. What's wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that. I had my tools, I kept my tools, I used my tools, used my knowledge. God bless, thank God for it. We went through hard times. We went through times when we didn't get enough money from the church, pay our bills. But I, God gave me the work to pay my bills. <laughs> so I said, thank the Lord, amen. So it is, thank the Lord. How many of you in a shape like that today? How many of you guys know what shade tree is? Amen. Yeah, they got these things so far now. You got to have, have $50,000 uh, computer plugged up to one to know what's wrong with it. Back when I worked on it, it wasn't like that. But anyway, the point is this. God provided. Yeah. I studied. I listened. I prayed. I learned. God had his purpose in me. I've been here for 47 years, folks, this coming August. It's not about me, but I'm trying to relate to you. I'm trying to help you today. When I came to temple, I was green. I didn't know anything. I knew I was saved. I've been saved three years. Can you imagine pastoring a church after three years? But I came in here full of zeal. I had more zeal than I had anything. <laughs> I had a lot of zeal. I did. I was fired up for the Lord. And I studied and I prayed and I knew God's hand was upon me and I stuck with it and I stayed at it. And I've been learning, and I'm still learning. And he's opening the book to me, and he's teaching me things, and he's showing me things that I need to learn, that I've got to know, and I want to learn. I love learning. I study. I love studying. I'll spend hours, hours preparing for a Wednesday night message. Not five minutes, hours preparing for it. Why? I want to give you something. That's just like this coming Wednesday night. If you'll come and listen, I'll give you something that it took time to get. It'll be better than what you see on TV. It'll be better than YouTube. It'll be better than that pornography that your wife doesn't know you're watching. It'll be better. Maybe you'll have a love for the word of God. I have become a father now. A father not in the sense that I brought my little girl in the world, but a father in the sense that they all look at me like that. A father. I've got something to say. The scripture's in my soul. Christ lives in me. I have a family. They know me. They've watched my life. I've been blessed. Ask any of them. Oh, he's not perfect. <laughs> Ask them. Well, they can pick out the warts. I got warts. I got. Listen, if you walk in my house, you can hear the bones rattling in the closet. <laughs> and if you walk into my house and open the, open the bone closet, you'll be get out of the way because there'll be a bunch of bones come flying out of that closet. Cover you. You say, but you can you. Are you kidding? Well, what about you? If you'll come Wednesday night and listen to what I've got to say, you may be surprised at what's going on that you're not really aware of. And that's what's important about walking with the Lord. What do you mean? I'm trusting him, not me. Him, not me. He did not put it into your hands for you to determine the way to walk and what's out there and how to deal with it when it comes to sin. That's his and his alone. But you've got to understand what you're dealing with and the nature of the life that we live. Now I'm on a mission. And let me give you the two things about this mission. Because this is important to me. Number one is the importance of Christ. Not me. You're hearing me because I'm me, I'm here. 
Another preacher could be up here saying the same thing. What am I that I haven't received of the Lord? I'm serious. That's not just saying that for effect. I know who I am. And I, I get down on my face before God and I say, God, I need you. 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 I do that. Christ needs to be preached. Every part of your life, there needs to be a relation to Christ in it. How does this relate? Where is he in my life? What's going on with me? You don't have the answers. I don't have the answer. But I know the answer. This past week, came on TV, a little four-year-old girl. I don't know her. Precious little four-year-old girl. They've called hospice in. She's leaving. She won't be here long. If you'd like to know what happens to children, read Diane Kampf's book, pediatrician, K-O-M-P, Diane Kampf. She has some stories that will make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. She was an atheist, had no use for God, but she was treating dying children. And things started happening around those children that she could not explain. And it got to her. And now she's written about three or four books, and they're quite remarkable. One little girl, as I've told you before, rose up in bed and said, Mommy, look at them. They're singing. Can you hear? They're singing. It's beautiful, Mommy. Mommy, it's beautiful. They're singing. The little thing dying with cancer. They're, be they're beautiful. Mommy, listen, they're singing. And then she just laid back down and went on to be with them. Well, Diane Kampf was in there when that happened and witnessed it. And she witnessed the hand of God in the life of that person. The hand of God in my life. They've called in hospice somewhere along the line. That little four-year-old girl going to be with the Lord. By the way, that's where children go. Well, my religion doesn't teach that one. Trash your religion. And get one that will preach the truth to you. Your little children are safe. Little babies are safe. But she's not the only one. There's not a one of you in this house this morning. If you could sense and feel and know for just this one moment in a world that's over, got over 7,000 million people in it and all the suffering and all the hurting and all the dying and all the sorrow and all the broken hearts and all that's going on at this moment, there's not a one of us that could stand it. We couldn't take it in. It's too much for us. We couldn't take it in. But God does. And then there's the power of love. When I first started preaching, I'd listen to other preachers and they'd say, God's a God of love. Why would he allow such and such to happen? You know what my answer was? I had an answer. We all got answers. Yeah, but God's a balanced being. Yeah, he's a balanced being, all right. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. I'm going to tell you what I've learned. There's nothing in this world greater than love. Real love. Nothing. Nothing. It was love that put those two hands up there like that. Love. That's what they nailed him to the cross with. Love. 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 Listen to this. We have a website, we, I mean, YouTube, and people comment. And I have found myself in the last few weeks reading and praying. <laughs> I'll come down through here and hear some soul will start pouring their soul out to God, asking for prayer, and people will just come to them on the YouTube channel. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. The comment section. You'll find, you, somebody will come on there and say, would somebody pray for me? I'm hurting. And, and 15 people reply. And they're praying for them. And they do. Well, I find myself reading that now. And I'll come to one and I'll stop and I'll start praying for them. And I'll come to another one and I'll stop and I'll start praying for them. A lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of hurt. A lot of it going on. A lot of it. It's everywhere. I read this the other day. I know a woman, her husband, who are evangelical Christians. They reared five kids in a very restrictive environment. Two of them are adults now. 
The children now rebelled against God, turned their back on the Lord, and they're running from God. Everything from sex to drugs and everything's involved in it. These kids had to go and talk to their grandmother about certain topics because discussing those topics with their parents were verboten. That's a German word for forbidden. Most of you know what that word means. It's forbidden. The mom and dad now are separated and are living in separate households. Both parents have banned their oldest son from their homes. This child needs them more now than ever, but they're refusing to talk to him. The person who wrote this said, I have no problem with the choices they made about rearing their kids, but I think that the persons a child should be able to talk to if she has any questions on any matter should be their parents. I mean, you agree with that? So what if your kid rebels against you? See, what if they do? Well, I mean, what if they get in your face and say, now look, you know, you got your way, I got my way. I'm not, you got your religious path, I got my own, I've got my way. So leave me alone. And out the door you walk. Now the parent stands, they poured their soul into you. They've done everything they know to do. And yet you are, you are an open rebellion against what they've taught you. Now, these parents are separated. That leads me to believe that their whole faith system is falling apart around them. Let yeah. me follow me here. Their whole belief system. So what do you mean? Have you ever heard it said that the angel of the Lord encampeth about them that fear him? How many has ever heard that? How many has ever read that? How do you understand that? That's the key. What do you mean, preacher? Doesn't that mean that if, if we live right, if we have a family, that, that we do the, all the right things, that, and we're pleasing in the sight of God, that he'll protect us from all this stuff that's happening in the world? Isn't that what that means? Isn't that what, well, you hear a lot of preaching like that. But that's not the real world. No. No, no, no. Bad things happen to good people. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Bad things happen to good people. Then, then, then how do I adjust my belief system? I heard a lady, and she's good. You remember those five Alka, the five missionaries that went down to, uh, to minister to the Alka Indians back in the 50s, and they were murdered? How many of you remember them? Oh, yeah. uh, I, think, I don't remember all their names, but one of them, one of them he, Nate, Nate Saint, I think it was, his wife or one of their wives uh, has been for years. She's gone now, but for years she's on the radio, and I listen to her a lot. And she, she's talking. That's it. You got it. Elizabeth Elliot. That's it. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Here's what she said. She said, when you come to something like this, now she, of course, is speaking firsthand. She lost her husband. She said, when you come to something like this and something begins to happen in your life, it starts coming apart, you can't understand it. You have no explanation for it, you know. Some preachers, they feel like they have to have an explanation. You don't have. That's a good witness for somebody. You don't have to have an answer for everything. But here's what she said. She said, when this happens to me, here's what I do. I go back to the Lord, and I rely, and this is what's important, on his character. The one that I serve and the one that I love, I trust his character. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Abraham said, I am but dust and ashes, his character. It would behoove us to learn something about his character, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. The character of God. I mean, that helped us a great deal. Now, here's the last thing I want to say to you. Now, we've got this broken family. Rebellious children. Mom and dad, you know, split apart. What do we do? Well, you've got counselors out there. Some of these counselors are good. They can do, they can do a lot of good. They can help you. But they're not always the answer. Uh, well, our church. Well, it depends on what church you go to and what kind of friends you have. If you've got the kind of friend of Galatians 6 that will help restore you, help comfort you, right. instruct you, stand by your side, give you some good wisdom and counsel, but not be judgmental and look down their nose at you. 
and try to kick you here and kick you there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people in the church, they like to see you vulnerable. That makes them feel good when they push yeah. you down. And if you're one of them, you've got a problem. Yeah. If you're the kind of person that feels good by shoving someone down, that means it's you yourself. You are literally a weakling, the worst kind. So what do you do with family like that? What do you do? How do you, how do you handle that? There's only one thing that can handle that. There's only one way that it can be done. That is the love of God. That is love in that family. That is loving a child, even if that child is full of rebellion, turns against you, turns on God, you still love them. They're still your child. That's still your daughter. That's still your son. They should understand that it makes a difference what happens, come hell or high water. It doesn't make any difference. It makes no difference. You're still going to be there. You're not going to take some high brow Pharisaic attitude and cut them out of your family or cut them out of your home. Then what? <laughs> then what? Amen. Well, it shows I'm approved. You know, don't have to worry about approving anything. No. Leave that to the Almighty. Yeah. They need somebody here. They need somebody here. That's what Father's Day is about. Yeah. Amen, That's Amen. what. Father's Day is about. Yeah. William Riley Weaver was born 1878. Jesse James was still robbing banks. He was. That's when my grandfather was born. That was the only father I ever knew. That gave me a touch to about five or six generations all the way back to the 1800s. He talked about stuff that people never heard of. And I grew up in that environment. He is my father the only father I've ever known in this world. Maternal, maternal, my mother's father. That's the only one I've ever had in this world. He showed me love. He'd come up at night when I was in bed, build a little room on the back of the house over there on Beaumont, just a little old room, lean-to thing. My brother and I slept in there. You could hear the mice running around at night. You ever had one run across your bed? That's exciting, isn't it? Oh, that's very exciting. Well, I'm in God's house. I'm before him, and I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> People today can't imagine something like that happening. In any event, here he'd come. He'd walk in there, and he'd tuck the cover around me. Then he'd reach over there and kiss me on the forehead. <laughs> I'll never forget that. That was the only light I had in this dark world was from him. When he did that, I knew he loved me. That's the only love I ever experienced until I met that girl back there in the back. I'd been in Okinawa for, been over there for a year. Went to the dry cleaners, getting my clothes done while I was on leave, waiting to find out my duty station. Didn't know if I was going to California or east or where. She walked through the door, and I said, who is that? Yeah. And it's been that way ever since then. <laughs> Who's that? Yeah. But if they hadn't told me, I'd have found out. <laughs> Father, I hope I said something to help somebody this morning. I do, Lord. There's some families in here maybe need some real healing. It may need to start with the parents. It may need to start with the dad. He's the leader. He's the protector. He's the provider. He's the one they're looking to. He's dad. It's Father's Day, Lord. That's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with having a Father's Day or Mother's Day. These are good things. We can use them to learn lessons. We can use them to glorify you. Father, I want you to make me a father. Make me a better father. Make me a better father than I've ever been in this world. I want, to be a, I want to be a father. I want to be the kind of father that they can respect. And Lord, you know me. I'm full of problems. I'm a, a failure in every way without you. But I ask you to bless. Move in the hearts of the people. In Jesus' name. Any of you fathers like to come down this morning and say, Lord, God, here I am. I'm going to accept what the responsibility. I'm a father. Lord, have mercy. What you've done for me. I'm a father, and it's not about me. It's about those who they are watching me. They are. You'd be surprised at how many are. You've got grandchildren watching you, even maybe great-grandchildren watching you. Who knows? You've got aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, 
wives, fathers. It's a serious thing to be a father in 2023, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The minute you walk out that door right there, you're walking into enemy territory. The minute you walk out that door right there, you're walking into a philosophy and a culture that is anti-Christ, anti-God, and anti-family. That's all you can make of it. Now, not everybody. There's a lot of good people out there. They're just like you in the same shape. But that's the, that's the predominant, that's the dominating culture at the moment. Put it that way. When you walk out there in it, Father, ask God to make you a father like you ought to be a father. Love those little children. Love that wife. Love your family. And when it starts coming apart in areas that you can't imagine, never expected it to happen, take hold of God and say, God, give me some of that love. I need your love. I need the love of God. I need, I, I'm, not, I'm not capable of it. It's got to be above me. It's got to be greater than me. And you'll be surprised at how love conquers all. Everything else will fail, but love never faileth. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13. Love never, charity, agape, never faileth. Father, bless thee, dear folk who've come. May this be a time, Lord, of, respect, uh, of retrospect, look back, and then a time of looking forward, prospect. Father, may it be a time, Lord, that we come before thee and ask you to search our soul and try us, not ourselves. We're incapable of it. And then, Lord, I pray for blessing. As you blessed Abraham and through Abraham we be blessed, bless them today. May this be a time that we glorify God. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Amen. God bless you, fathers. Amen. When God made Eve, he didn't make her from the ground because the ground's cursed. She didn't come into existence because of the seed. She didn't come into existence because of, of, uh, of, of, of birth like us. She was taken from the side of a man, from his bone. She was taken from his side. When the Lord Jesus died on the cross, they took a spear and they shoved it into where? And forthwith came blood and water. Well, when you take a rib from a man, where did you take that rib from? Front or from the side? Side. Exactly. There's something going on there. Yes, there is. You see, ladies, ladies did not bring and do not bring the curse into this world. Men, it is in the seed. It is on us. Amen. Accept that responsibility. Yes, sir. Amen. What do we got, brother? 209 All-American Church Hymnal, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go.